Welcome to the record presented by Ketamaran Ventures and 314 Capital. We have with us Mr. N. R. Narayan Murthy. In this episode, we'll talk about good corporate governance and why it is important. Mr. Murthy, do we require corporate governance in enterprises which are private, maybe public too? And what is good corporate governance in your view? Well, uh, wherever there is more than one individual who is uh, who are part of the equity pool, then good corporate governance is necessary. The reason is, when there is more than one individual, there is always a possibility of distrust. Because the primary reason for malgovernance is creating asymmetry of benefits by one person vis-a-vis -vis others. Whether the others happen to be uh, three million investors or three, it's the same. And the moment there is distrust, relationship suffers. The moment the relationship suffers, that other party may start doing things inim inimical to the betterment of the company. Therefore, creating a mechanism to enhance the trust of every individual, whether they're three shareholders or three million, is what corporate governance tries to do, good corporate governance tries to do. Therefore, I would say it's necessary. Now, uh, many people say, this is my company, I own 80%, 90%, I run it, I spend all my time. You're welcome as a shareholder, but I decide. Now, this attitude that people have, even in a private company, and sometimes in a public company, what would you advise them? Why is it, is it in their interest, interest of a controlling shareholder to have good corporate governance? Well, what... Uh good corporate governance does is to enhance respect for the company. Once you enhance respect for the company, you attract, uh, you know, you attract repeat business from customers. Good employees join you. If you are listed, long-term investors invest, come and stay with you. The uh, government of the land will treat you with respect. Then vendor partners will provide uh, preferential uh, uh, treatment to you. And the society respects you. Society is the most important constituent because society contributes customers, society contributes employees, society contributes investors, and society elects politicians, and society contributes bureaucrats. Therefore, earning the respect of the society is very important, and that is possible only by good corporate governance. There are several reasons why corporate governance may deteriorate, but the main reason well, you can say that the main reason is creating asymmetry of benefits by owner managers in relation to other shareholders. What do I mean by that? Let me imagine a situation. I own 60% in this company A, but I have another private company unlisted company where I own 100%. Now, I create related party transaction between this listed company A and the unlisted company B to the disadvantage of company A but to the advantage of B because I want that uh, company B where I own 100% 100%. to grow faster. Now, that is happening at the cost of the shareholders of the listed company A. And that's one. The second reason is when the either the owner managers or mostly the so-called professional managers, they start 
creating a symmetry of benefits for themselves to the ex to the detriment of the shareholders let me give you an example there there is a company that i acquire i acquire it for 250 million dollars but after a couple of years i find that it's not even worth 50 million dollars this is a classical example of creating detriment to the majority of shareholders to the to the benefit of the manage the so called professional managers so the third is the third uh, angle and that is you may provide un justifiable compensation to the top management with the we the competitors in the field and that again is to the detriment of the shareholders because there are your competitors who are performing equally well but they are not getting that kind of thing that means the differential between the compensation <coughs> to the senior management of company a and the equally well performing company b is taken from shareholders money so therefore the fundamental issue here is how do i reduce the asymmetry of benefits accruing to the owner managers or professional managers that results in detriment to the majority of the shareholders the responsibility of doing this rests with the board as long as there is a chairman of the board who a believes in transparency who believes in accountability who believes in fairness then things will work well but the day the chairman becomes a victim of the charm of the senior management that's when the company starts going down no board member should be in awe of the senior management particularly the ceo that's very very important because when you sit as the chairman of the company or when you sit as the chairman of the audit committee your commitment is not to the ceo is not to the senior management but your commitment is to the majority of the shareholders in such a way that you are fair to the ceo you are fair to the other senior management but not unfair to the majority of the shareholders that's what happens in most parts of the world now there are two phases of your life as a entrepreneur and the founder of infosys one was from the date of founding to the date of listing yeah. just for classification yeah. Yeah. and post listing yeah how did you what are the principles that you had to follow good corporate governance when you were a private company without public shareholders coming in what did you follow well there are two phases in the growth of any company the first is what we call the entrepreneurial phase and the second is what we call managerial phase entrepreneurial phase is one where resources are highly limited and it is very very difficult to attract good talent it's very difficult to get good customers it's very difficult to get good vendor partners who will give you reasonable uh, terms you end up spending lot of your time in dealing with the authorities therefore this phase requires lot of smartness lot of commitment lot of discipline lot of sacrifice a uh, lot of courage of the leaders let me give you a very simple example in 1983 we were trying to install a latest general mb8000 computer in bangalore or chennai or whatever it is 
we want it to use part of the computer time on that for our own export software development and part for a well-known company which will provide us steady cash flow. Now, I came to know uh, sometime in June 1982, sorry, June 1982, not 83, 82, that Maiko was looking for such an arrangement. Those days, it was almost impossible for multinationals to import any computer because oh. computers were thought of as... Job uh, destroyers. Yeah, as uh, inhibitors of job growth, which is completely wrong anyway. So, I came to Bangalore. Of course, those days, only train. I mean, no plane and all of that. And I requested the highest manager saying that I want time. Said, sir, we have already decided this is too late. I said, no, I'm not expecting you to change your decision. I just want to speak on a technical topic. You are all technical people, you know this, on a quantitative method of analyzing and evaluating the architecture of a super mini computer. I had worked on the architecture of MB8000 and WAX 11750, 780, etc. So finally they agreed. They were fair people, good people. They agreed. I started at uh, 10 a.m. And I had prepared, those days you had perspective, not, uh, no PowerPoint. No nothing. PowerPoint. And uh, I had used a book by a professor from University of Washington, Seattle, on the mathematical method for architecture evaluation. He used a lot of equation and compared MB8000 with others. And I asked them, what, what, do, what do the other people say? Oh. They didn't know anything. <laughs> They're not in the analysis. And when my one o'clock came, I had covered about 30% because there were lots of questions. There were bright people, bright youngsters. They said, is it possible for you to continue? I said, sure. They gave me lunch and we well, know. It went up to 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Wow. 6 p.m. What was considered to be an hour's lecture actually ended up ended up as eight eight hours. They were very professional and people of highest integrity, merit oriented, all of that. So then I had asked a lot of questions about my competitors' architecture. What does it do? What does it do? They had no answer. I said, please write down and ask them. Then, two years, ah, sorry, two days later, there was no answer from the competitors. Then they asked, would you like to be considered for evaluation? I said, of course. And finally, we won. Actually, we had, we had, you know, pretty good rates per hour. So the moral the, of the story was that when you are competing with giants, you cannot use their strong points to compete. It's not possible. You will be just, you know, yes, swatted. The better thing is to compete on your strength and compete on their weaknesses. They didn't have answers to all the things. They were not as uh, technically oriented as I was. They had not read many books and all. So we won. And that required a lot of hard work. I traveled by train. You know, fortunately, I, my mother was here. It's okay. I used to take a rickshaw to my co. All of that. Second. I think 
in the entrepreneurial phase, you have to have a lot of courage. We don't have much time to give incidents. In our own case, on the MV8000 case, we had to get approval from Bosch headquarters for us to install the computer in the micro-administrative office and they had to lease that premises to us because Department of Electronics had created this silly rule. And we had to put a small board outside. It had never happened in the history of micro. But two of my colleagues were here, they had given up. Oh, what will happen? It has never happened in the history of Michael, they will not do that, let's forget it. I said, no, I want to try. I finally managed, Mr. Vikram Bhatt is probably the, the finest leader I have come across because as long as you're doing what is legal, as long as you're ethical, as long as you have merit, he was a rare leader. He would fight for you. Had very few such leaders. So finally, when I sat down with him and explained, he said, I will take it up with my the leader in Germany. And he prepared a strong case. And he won. My colleagues, definitely one of them had given up. Said, how oh, will it happen? This has never happened. All of that. So, the point I'm making is, in the entrepreneurial phase, there is very little money. You need a lot of courage. You need to make a lot of sacrifices. Those days, you know, I used to travel, of course, Pan Am was the thing, by economy, from economy. Bombay. Oh. First go from Bangalore to Bombay, Bombay to New York, and reach there at somewhere around 5 a.m. or something, and 9 o'clock you have to be present for, for a presentation. And you have By economy. And economy, you were sitting all the time. You were, we had to do that. And some of my colleagues, they stayed in very seedy hotels in Manhattan, where, as the Kannada saying says, if one man enters, two people will have to come out. <laughs> so, I think entrepreneurial phase is where you need a lot of smartness, a lot of courage, a lot of sacrifice, and you have to take quick action. Because the whole world is stacked against you. And the only way you can seize the opportunity is by taking quick action. Let me give you a simple incident. You know, I was talking to my co-brother when he founded his first company, which was a fiber optics company. Uh, I said, you are so small and your competitors are so huge. You know, AT&T, Nortel, all of that. What is your competitive advantage? And he said, my competitive advantage is I can take quick decisions, I can work 20 hours, and I can complete what is needed in one-fourth the time that they will take. That's why I will win. So as you know, Mohan, you have said it many times at emphasis. These days, it is not the big that eat the small. It is the nimble that will eat the behemoths. So therefore, in entrepreneurial phase is what really determines the quality of entrepreneur and it lays a strong foundation. And the next is also very important because in the managerial phase, your aspirations are higher. You want to grow big. You want sales revenue to grow fast. You want to protect profitability. You want to attract good talent. Uh, and you want to uh, create infrastructure, you want new technology. All these things require a lot of 
high quality managers who can collect proper data and take quick decisions while the entrepreneurial faith will lay the foundation to come up to a level where managers can fly from there there are so many cases where even very good quality entrepreneurs fail because they could not attract good quality managers managers and then take the company public all of that so therefore both are very important because in the managerial phase you need processes you need clearly demarked functions you need people who will take quick decisions you need informed people you need very confident managers you need a leader to make sure that the team works well all of that so both these phases are phases are required but you can't do without either That's and uh, when do you need a independent good board at what point of time in your journey when you want to go public before you go public do you need a good board at all can you manage without the board well i think that is another very important question very good question my own view is that the internal team has to get prepared to create a mindset of openness to questioning by others a mindset of data and facts a mindset of agreeable discussion and debate a mindset of learning from people who bring a lot of experience that is the first phase if you remember all of us did it from 95 you joined in 94 and 95 to 97 and that's when you try to uh, produce quarterly uh, you know quarterly statements you know enhance the transparency and all of that and if you remember the first person that we invited was deepak satwalekar and then marty subramaniam and then sushim datta then george etc by 97 uh, end we had all these people but that was two years or one and a half years before we went public on nasdaq yes right we in 93 even though we had gone public okay. in india at that time we didn't have an independent board yes because at that time government also didn't insist sab also didn't insist but because people like you had a global view when you were leading the team for listing on nasdaq you articulated to all of us that there is a need for a high quality independent board and we all agreed that such a board will only come and participate if we are open to suggestions if we want to learn from them if we want to discuss and debate agreeably etc etc so i i think it is very very important to in first get prepared to invite an independent board and to be listed that you don't you don't have to wait till the last minute that you get listed to prepare your quarterly statements to have the level of uh, transparency. transparency that you want all of that can be done Once internally even before you get listed and then invite those uh, savants those uh, wise men and women and then create an environment of open discussion learning from them all of that and then you can get listed but when you invite people to the board what are the characteristics that you look for how do you choose the right kind of people you know more how do you make sure yeah. that you have a board uh, which really helps you how do you construct the board you know mohan i have always tried 
to invite people on the board who could question me. Who could question you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No issue at all. You know, you have been part of this. Marty and I used to fight so much. Yes. But as friends. Yes, yes. Of outside, course. of course. You were, you know, we'd be drinking coffee and smiling. But on a typical issue, you and Marty argued a lot. I and Marty argued a lot. Deepak and I argued a lot. Then uh, Philip, you and I argued a lot. Then there was... Uh, Claude. Huh? Claude. Claude. Claude, yeah. Claude uh, uh, and I, we argued a lot. You argued a lot. Nandan argued a lot. So, I think you have to invite only those who do not, who are not overcome by awe of the CEO. Because the day that happened, it did happen in some companies. Yes. The day the chairman of the board is in awe of the CEO, is that's gone. the end of the company. So uh, that's when thing. all these asymmetry of benefits in favor of the professional manager, all of that will start. So first is uh, they must be able to question you, have the competence to question you, yes, yes. have the knowledge to question yeah. you. No, that's a very good point you made. When we selected, if you remember, we said we want somebody who has made mergers and acquisition, yes. who understands strategy. So we invited Sushim Datta. Yes. Then we said we want somebody who is operating at the leading edge of finance. Yes. Uh, and, uh, Marty yeah, was Marty. a professor at uh, Stern and he could hold debate with you. Yeah. So we invited Marty. Then we wanted somebody who had lead, who had connections with various corporate leaders, you know, in Asia. We invited Giorgio. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Filippo. 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 Then we said, look, we want somebody who understands the nuts and bolts of how to run an organization. So we invited Deepak Satwalekar, who was head of operations at. HDFC. So I think you need to bring complementary strengths which are mutually exclusive but collectively exhausted. Even for the board. Even for the board, absolutely. And the chairman must be somebody who is not in awe of any of the senior management. And he must have stature, he must have confidence, all of that. The day that is not there, now, you were chairman of the board, but you were an executive chairman. Yeah. You had operational responsibility. Yeah. You had a CEO, yeah. but you are chairman of the board. Yeah. Now, there are two different roles. Yeah. How did you play the two different roles? I mean, I can give the answer, but I would like you to say, how did you play the two different roles uh, to a T? I mean, it's almost as if you're a very different person in the board compared to when you were in the management team as chairman. Well, you know, I had... A an unusual advantage. First of all, I was 10 or 11 years older than others. I was their boss at PCS. I always looked at all these wonderful people as my younger brothers. And they are also very kind to me. Therefore, even though I was the executive chairman, I mean, even though I was the chairman of the board, I operated in an executive capacity in the internal discussions because uh, Nandan, who is the CEO, fully cooperated with me and he had no hesitation in my discussing detailed issues. Yeah. He also knew that I, I am a very detailed person and there was no issue. Second, I think he knew that I was only trying to make him stronger. Stronger and better. Uh, therefore, we shared a lot of sales responsibilities. And he also knew that I had an unusual interest in finance. Yes. So therefore, you did not have any problem. Yes. Nandan did not have any problem. So I think these things cannot be argued on a theoretical basis. You have to come out with a solution 
that fits a specific situation. But the most important principle is it should not create any unnecessary tension in the minds of the operating personnel, whether the CEO or the CFO or anybody. And I had that advantage and I'm very grateful to all my colleagues, including you, you know, Nandan, yourself, Chris and all of that. And uh, it may work in some places, it may no, not work. No, but when you are chair, when you're in a board meeting, you are a very different person. Of course. Because in the board meeting, if the board members question management, yeah. and there were some things management had not done, you agreed with the board, you didn't try to defend the management, oh, absolutely. even though you were part of the management team oh, absolutely. that presented. Absolutely. What is the mindset that you need to have uh, when you sit as a chairman of a board? Well, you know, Governance is all about critiquing the strategy of the company for an enduring success in achieving industry-led growth in both revenues and profitability. That's the first. It's the management that crafts the strategy. It is the board that brings its experience in critiquing, in improving that, number one. The second responsibility of the board is making sure that all systems of control are in place so that the financial uh, <coughs> controls are safe and sound and that there is no pilferage and there is no wrong reporting. The third important role of the board is risk management. And that is the, the organization in its desire to press on the pedal and grow, you know, does not protect, does, does not protect profitability, does not violate any law of the land, Okay, does not do anything that is unfair to any individual, does not allow any sexual harassment, and at the same time ensures that all whistleblower complaints are handled properly, etc. Et and the next one is, of course, succession planning. Succession planning. Right? No, these are completely. Uh, you know, different from what management. the management does. The board decides in obviously the basis management ideas on what business should be should we be in or what market we should be should we be in and what kind of aspiration we should have there and how we protect uh, risk and all of that. On the other hand, management's responsibility is to ensure that whatever the board and the management together have decided is executed with the highest level of excellence. And reported back. Abdul, and reported. That is the thing. So therefore, when I was sitting as the chairman, I was number one amongst equals in some way. In the board. In the board to make sure that the board's responsibility and rights are fully protected. On the other so you hand... You never took the side of the management? No, because uh, the, you're, otherwise, you're, you're, you're otherwise the good people would also not, not serve, join. Not join. That is very important. And as I've said, once again, I'll repeat this. Unless you try to attract people who are not in awe of the founders and the CEO, and who are not ready to question them, that it's, it's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. Now tell me, how do you make a board effective? When I say effective, let us assume you've got five or six independent members. How do you conduct board meetings so they have the say, they're encouraged to speak on every topic, take the time, they're encouraged to study, they're questioned, yeah. and their performance is evaluated. Yeah. You are the first, if I'm right, to bring in board performance evaluation Absolutely. in India. Absolutely. Where there was a peer yeah. evaluation much before yeah. regulations came. Yeah. You set 
you for you you set in place most of the corporate governance norms that india follows uh, based on standards you had the corporate governance committee yeah, yeah. for norms for sebi now how did you as chairman ensure the effectiveness of the board what are the what are the things that you must do as chairman to have effectiveness first of all as you remember mohan we ensure that no executive director was part of the audit committee what that meant was it gave full independence to the chairman and members of the audit committee to question to suggest improvement all of course you were on the other side of the yeah. cfo but you were not part of the committee yeah. similarly we did not have any executive director on the nominations and the That remunerations is. committee second <clears throat> it was very very important for us to ensure that our independent members of the board understood our business very well so we had two mechanisms first is we took them through a reasonably detailed, detailed one week long uh, program where we made some initial presentations and then they met all the senior people in various functions that was also very important the third thing is if you remember we coupled an executive director with an independent director and uh, once a year they made presentations yes. on what are the challenges they face in a certain function what should be our strategy how we will move you know etc etc and the fourth was what you mentioned peer evaluation we had a completely independent peer evaluation of the independent and members of the board and the chairman sat down with the concerned director. board member and tried to understand why he or she has not performed as well as expected and what is it that we can do to help that person and uh, you know any any special courses that he or she wants to attend at any business school in india or abroad or any special uh, uh interaction with one of the executive members etc so i think these are some of the things that we did and i'm sure there are many more that companies have evolved over the years yeah but uh, when you did all those items of corporate governance now looking back were mm. you satisfied that you got as founder as chairman executive chairman as chairman on the board your expectation of board members were met in full or in part are very disappointed are you felt uh, there were some shortcoming well you know i am a human being i understand that in any population there will be a certain percentage of high performers that's a small percentage and there is a significant percentage of average people average performers and there is a small percentage of low performer board uh, reflects that reflects exactly despite the that. selection despite getting despite the best that we had done it did but that is the reality of the world okay after all fortunately as you know we had this term limits yes so at the end of the term you know people would voluntarily step down there were very kind people very honorable people very good people it happened uh so i don't think we had any issue on that but the bigger problem arises when the board does not spend particularly enough. the independent member enough does time. not spend enough time 
on transactions put forward by the management that looks somewhat unusual. And well, we have seen that such things have happened. And that could lead to huge problems. And that is where there is, that's what really creates asymmetry of benefits. And this thing happens when the chairman of the board is in awe of the senior manager. So the that's, chairman has the great responsibility. That's what absolutely. You, to make it the, work. The and he's critical. Of, absolutely. The success of the board depends on the personality of the chairman, the confidence of the chairman, the, 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 the desire of the chairman to provide transparency, uh, uh, fairness and accountability. Now, but, uh, now on the board, let us forget somebody called Narayan Murthy. Would you recommend an internal founder, an internal member to be chairman of the board? Or would you say the best thing is to get an outsider to be chairman of the board? who is willing to spend time, etc. Because let's forget Naran Muthi. He was successful as a CEO, executive director, and chairman of the board. Now, that is extraordinary. Mon, this is a very important question. I'm glad you asked it. My view is that maintaining the culture of the board is extremely important. As you know, Peter Drucker once said, culture eats strategy for lunch. The Failure of most boards have happened when at the same time you had a new CEO and a new chairperson. Therefore, my advice to all the wonderful entrepreneurs that may listen to this is that they should not let this happen. In other words, either the chairman new chairman comes or either the new CEO comes. But when he, uh, uh, when that new person comes, there should be somebody in the other seat who has fully imbibed the culture of honesty, culture of value system, culture of Another transparency, all of that. Otherwise, it's a recipe for disaster. So would you say that both have to be separate people? Would you say that? Barring some extraordinary circumstances. Uh, in some sense, it depends upon at what stage, what stage you are. For example, we had a very unusual situation, yes. if you remember. We had, my desire has always been to have a lot of executive directors yes. from the internal management. Yes. Uh, we had you, we had Furnish, you know, we had Nandan, Chris, Dinesh, Shibulal. In other Dinesh. words, there were so many internal directors. So in such a situation, I did not want a situation where I, as the founder of the company, had to defend my co-founders and I had to create a, 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 some kind of a... Uh, perception that I was higher than the chairman. Kindly understand that problem. Yes, yes. So therefore, as long as I was there, I had to be the chairman. Otherwise, there would be instances where there would be a disagreement between the internal directors and the chairman and somebody had to intervene. Yes, right. that could be the lead independent director. Yeah. Well, you it know, may not work. Yeah, if the if the internal director does not uh, disagree, uh, does not agree with the lead independent director, then what happens? Because I had a long association with my colleagues, I knew what their mindset is. I knew why they were saying a certain thing. I knew their level of knowledge, I, uh, their expertise, and therefore. In a very unobtrusive way, I would could send a chit to the concerned director You're saying that, not. yes, this there is some value in what he's saying. This has to be, yeah, done, it has to be done in a very subtle way. Subtle it can't way. be open uh, discussion debate. So conflict resolution in the board is very critical for the chairman. 
Oh, whenever there is conflict. And as long conflict. as the chairman has the gravitas. persona, has the gravitas, has the, the, the personality, has the confidence, has the charisma, has the competence, then it's okay. Otherwise, it's So, okay. sudden change in management and the board chairman is... is, is, is Simultaneous is. change in bringing a person new to the culture of the company as the chairman and another person as the CEO is absolutely recipe for disaster. But you also uh, compensated your board members well. At a time when nobody got compensated, you, paid, you, you, you had very good compensation and a bench, global benchmark. Yeah. Why did you do that? You didn't have to do that. It was a prestigious company. People would join. But uh, you did it. Is it fairness or is it to demonstrate respect for the board members and their time? No, and, Mohan. And a view and compensation. Mohan, you know, you, Nandan, Chris, myself, we all had this discussion. Yes. We said, if we want to be a global company, we just got listed on NASDAQ. If we want global investors, then we should have some global people, globally recognized people on the board. It can't all be Indians. So we had Larry Pressler. Yeah, of Lord. course, we had Monty Subramanian, who was very well known in his field on Lord. a global basis. Then we had Filippo. Lord. Yeah, Claude. You know, Larry Pressler, many, all of them. In order to attract those people, we had to give, in addition to all other wonderful things that Infosys provided in terms of environment, discussed a bit and all, we had to look at certain hygiene factors like compensation. compensation. So, therefore, we said we have to compete with the best boards in the world. At that time, we were definitely Among somewhere them. in the top. So, that, that, was that, the, that, that, that was the required. That was the reason. Now, when you look at, uh, uh, when you look at boards, how do you see strategy versus governance? Strategy and governance. The management has to define strategy. Yeah. Boards like to get into strategy, but management wants boards to look at governance and to tell them whether they are on the right path is kosher, right? This interplay of strategy and management, I mean, and governance, and both somewhat sometimes have strong views about some things which uh, management may say may not work. So, how do you resolve this issue of strategy and governance? Because the board has to okay the gov okay the strategy. Well, I think it takes two to play this game. First of all. I do believe that strategy is part of governance. Strategy is part of governance? Governance. Not Absolutely. management. No, management prepares the strategy. The board reviews it, asks a lot of questions, and then it agrees. Yeah, but the, do the boards have the competence to review a very complex strategy done by, let's say, a very high-tech technology company? No, in, in some way, the kind of people that you choose okay. would have to be those who, who have understand the some business. level of competence. Okay. And then it is, the, it is the responsibility of the management to provide the required papers and the required knowledge to hold a meaningful discussion. Third, the reality is that the strategic question most often is common sense. Is common sense? Most often. You're saying this? Yeah, in the sense, what market should we be in? Okay. Then the board should say, okay, supposing you say, I want to be in this market. You will ask a question. I, mean, uh, I as an independent director, will say, why should we be in that question? Yeah. Can you substantiate? Correct. Right? Then uh, you say... You know, we can make only 10%. What I'll say, no, this is the company has gotten used to 23%. Why, why, why are we getting into it? Please explain. Correct. Right? Okay. So, I personally believe that 
it is a good idea for the company to provide a week long training program in what is the business of the company what are the Driver. strategic choices that we had why we have chosen whatever we have chosen and what are the the factors that could influence our strategy in the future once we explain it to people i think they are all intelligent people of course and it will it will be a meaningful dialogue and there is a there is a certain value in bringing a person from a different field into this discussion because he or she brings a different perspective absolutely he or she brings tremendous value he or she will ask you questions that we had not thought of because we have looked at it from very close quarters so i think it has tremendous value but it all works as good as the chairman <laughs> that at the end of the day it, it is, is all the quality of the chairman that that determines and ceo for ceo for business chairman for the board oh absolutely absolutely i'm only talking of governance now yeah. it is the quality of the chairman that determines the quality of governance and you're right if the governance is poor then management won't succeed because if you are running in the wrong direction management if you are running faster it is worse than not running at all yeah therefore while management responsibility is primarily to execute what the board and the management have together decided with the highest level of excellence you have to ensure that the board is fully empowered with knowledge and the board asks the right questions the board provides a uh, meaningful input and justifies what input it gives why it gives that all of that and those are the responsibilities of the chair now now we have seen several instances globally and in all almost all countries of superstar ceos and boards which are not effective so what should boards do to make sure that the ceo that the boards control the ceo compensation reviews and all that and the ceo knows very clearly what the role of the board is and what his role is what should boards do you know i mean i understand uh, what companies you are referring to these are truly global companies they were they were stars but what i would say is this that these were kind of exceptions okay you know when you talk of a steve jobs or a bill yeah bill gates or larry ellison or the don musk but even there i am confident i am confident that there would have been questions and answers yes there would have been uh concerns expressed and once the concern resulted in reality after a quarter or two things were taken for example remember uh, uh this guy i forget the the guy who came uh, uh, on pepsi right who he he fired steve jobs yeah what's his name i forget anyway yeah he fired uh, steve jobs yeah right uh so i think i always believed that the true index of power is the humility the courtesy and the grace with which you, you exercise power. that you exercise power yeah and that power has to be exuded in a way that the team wins and not just the superstar and That's by and large it happened now tell me you have been on several you know global boards you have spent a lot of time yeah. on global boards and yeah. non profit sector profit sector everywhere governments now how do you see your experience the global board vis-a-vis -vis your experience as chairman of infosys 
were you able to have a higher standards in your board as chairman than what you saw in many global boards? You know, it's a very, most people know in which global boards I served. Yeah. Therefore, it, this is not a question I'd like to answer. Okay. Uh, because. But how, how did those boards work, Ms. Sebis? You saw this, your board work. I think we were not less than any of those boards. Absolutely. No, no issue at all. We were. But I don't want to judge whether we were better, they were better, okay. all of that. But we were. But did you learn anything from the global board? Would you say you learned something from being on global boards? Oh. Is it? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, I learned on, about the focus of innovation from a board in, uh, in the area of uh, uh, FMCG. Their focus on innovation and the way they every uh, quarter there was a presentation that I think was that you learned. That's good. Now we also did. We also but did. I think. Uh, but but tell me, uh, your advice to young founders, your advice would be, um, work to have a good board. Yeah. Have good independent people. Create a culture of transparency. Look for a good chairman. And. Uh, to investors on the startup boards, don't rock the board too fast. Make sure that, you know, boards work effectively. You need a chairman, and if the founder is the chairman, work with them. Yeah. But make sure that the changes are not abrupt in both ways. Is that what you are saying? Yeah, I, I, I entirely agree with all you said, except, once again, I want to reaffirm that culture is extremely important. Therefore, don't bring new people or people from another culture at the same time as both the ch as the chairman and the CEO. In other words, only one person can come from a new culture, either the chairman or the CEO, but not both. Not both. That will be a disaster. No. My yeah. last question to you, sir, in this episode would be, how does the chairman and the board respond in terms of a crisis? I mean, you have been to a few crises and you come out trumps. What should boards and chairmen do in terms of a crisis? Well, you have been a close witness to one of the crises yeah. that we handled. Yeah. And I was in London and I got a call and I told the person, don't worry, I will handle it because that was my responsibility. And I took the flight that evening itself. Within a matter of two and a half, three hours, came to Bangalore, and I, I dispatched you and Chris to San Francisco. And uh, I called all the members of the board. We had a long teleconference, because they couldn't come at such yeah, a time. Yeah. There were some who came, but most were on the thing. And I told them that this is a value system transgression. Therefore, the best thing is to part ways. And there were one or two people who thought that too harsh. he would be too harsh and most Compromising more them. important, we will be endangering the future of the organization. In fact, a lot of... Uh, Institutional investors told me that I should not do that. You should not because do. within that period of two days, I spoke to a lot of them. several. I don't want to mention the names, but without exception, they all said you should forget about all these problems. More important is share price. More important is revenue. And this man is very good. I said, don't worry, I will take full responsibility for this and I'll handle it. So we did what was right, uh, and that's where I think everybody cooperated very well. So the important thing is to bring data and facts to the attention of the board, to provide the board with the various scenarios, and then justify 
your option why it is so listen to them but never ever be beaten by fear beaten by fear by fear or you know or by uh, by thinking about whether i should compromise because it is the future of the organization i think that is the thing. you should and, not and that's the time when the caliber of the chairman and the board comes into play in some way yes some way yes that's what i would say so mr murthy thank you very much for this episode on corporate governance there's been a lot of learning and we are grateful to you for sharing your views with us thank you very much thank you